Many of you uh, remember that name. He was a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys in the 1970s. Uh, he took uh, his team to the championship in 1971 and won it. And uh, he was really frustrated because he could never call his own signals. And it was Coach Landry that sent in every play. Coach Landry told him when to pass and when to run, and he could only change the play in an extreme emergency. And if he ever changed the play, he better get it right or he would be in trouble. Uh, so Staubach, you know, he considered Coach Landry uh, to be a genius, but his pride said that he should be able to run his own team. Uh, but Roger later said, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. At a uh, meeting of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Bobby Richardson, he was a former uh, New York Yankee second baseman, he offered a prayer, and it's really classic in its brevity and its poignancy, but here, here's his prayer. He said, Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, amen. Uh, that's what it's all about, right? Uh, I read an article by Brett McCracken this week entitled, Lordship is Not Legalism. And he talked about the idols that we hold dear as Americans. And he listed them. He said, uh, they are uh, consumerism, comfort, uh, freedom, and individualism. And he said, all four of these idols are rooted in the autonomy of self. In other words, self is Lord, and is, there is no other authority besides self that we must obey or follow. And uh, McCracken said, America loves the autonomy of self. We are a people who are self-made, and we wish to be unregulated. Our mantra is, be who you want to be. Follow your dreams. Find yourself. And so we celebrate this individualism without constraints. And some of the examples that he gave in his article about this self-autonomy is a married couple who wants to call it quits because their marriage is no longer satisfying, or uh, wanting to end a pregnancy because the timing is unplanned or inconvenient, or the government's protection of an adolescent boy who identifies with the opposite sex and seeks opportunities to be treated as such. Those are some of the examples he gave. And then he said, by going on in his article, sadly, self-autonomy has made its way into the church culture. And, and some of the ways we see that is a willingness to bend to the rules, uh, to bend the rules in order to cater to those who see things differently, even if their actions stand outside the bounds of God's law. Or we see it in our unwillingness to be in submission to the authority God has established over his church. And we would rather follow our own way. And, and so we, we kick against the goads. H have you ever heard that phrase, kick against the goads? It's actually in Scripture. And uh, it's in Acts chapter 26, verse 14. And the Apostle Paul is retelling his conversion experience as he's on the road to Damascus and Christ appears to him in a bright and shining light and Paul and everyone else falls to the ground. He was referred to as Saul back then but this is what Acts 26 verse 14 says. <clears throat> and when we had fallen to the ground I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language Saul Saul why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so those are the words of Christ. And so the ox goad is this long pole or stick with a pointed piece of iron fastened to the end of it. In the strong hands of a loving master, the ox is gently prodded and guided and steered and driven 
in the desired direction when plowing the fields. But when a stub stubborn ox attempts to kick back against the goad that is causing it discomfort, the ox will actually inflict more pain upon himself, driving the pointed end deeper into his flesh. And so prior to Paul's conversion, he was kicking against the goads. He, he was going against the authority of Christ. He was arresting Christians and throwing them in prison. And he was presiding over their executions. He was defying the living Christ and his authority. He was kicking against the goads. How might it be that we are kicking against the goads? In our uh, Bible study this, this week, <clears throat> uh, Thursday evening, we were looking at 1 Kings chapters 12 and 13, and it deals with the reign of Jeroboam of the northern kingdom of Israel. The, the kingdom of Israel uh, was divided. Uh, ten northern tribes went with Jeroboam, and the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, went with Rehoboam. And so God... God said to, to Jeroboam, if you follow my commands and do what I say, your reign will prosper and you will reign and you will have a long dynasty. But as you read in 1 Kings 12 and 13, Jeroboam developed a new way of worshiping God that was contrary to the commands and instructions of God. And so he uh, put in place people to be priests who were not of the tribe of Levi uh, he erected temples on the high places and in places that weren't in Jerusalem. Uh, he set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan, for the people to worship so they wouldn't go to Jerusalem and worship. Uh, he even set up his own liturgical calendar, so he created these feasts that were contrary to God's will. And so in 1 Kings 12, we read things like, he also made, and Jeroboam appointed, and he offered sacrifices, and he placed in Bethel, he had made, he had devised from his own heart, and he instructed. And so you see in all those phrases, it was all about what Jeroboam was doing and not about what God had instructed or what God had commanded. In other words, Jeroboam ignored the word of God in order to follow his own heart and his own inclinations. And this led to the downfall of his realm, his reign, his dynasty. And I think the application is clear. We must learn submission to the living God. And so our fifth and final membership vow reads, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? How can we fulfill this vow as members of Christ's church? What I have here today is uh, what's called the Book of Church Order. And uh, this is a book uh, that governs every church in our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America. And uh, so this is the guideline as to how we're organized and how we're uh, to be able to order our, our ways here. And um, it has three sections. Uh, the first section is the form of government. How are we organized as a government in the church? And then the second se section is the rules of discipline. What if someone is wayward or unruly, how do we go about a disciplinary process? And then the third section is the directory of the worship of God. Uh, now there's something I want you to see about this book of church order. Uh, notice that it is a loose leaf binder. And the reason for that is you can easily take pages out and put new pages in. Uh, because they're always changing this. They're always updating it, always trying to improve it, always trying to perfect it. Every year they are changing sentences or phrases or changing paragraphs. And uh, so that's why it's a loose-leaf uh, bound book. Now the other book I have here 
is the word of God. Now notice this is not a loose leaf bound book. This is permanently bound. And the reason it's permanently bound is because it's perfect. It doesn't have to be added to or subtracted from. Uh, if you try to add to or subtract from something that's already perfect, you will make it imperfect. And so this is the word of God. And so we call the book of church order a subordinate standard, meaning it's subordinate to the word of God. The word of God stands above as the highest authority. And all other standards are below it as subordinate standards. And when we forget this order of things, we are no better than Jeroboam, who forgot to listen to the words of God. Now, the word Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros. You'll find that throughout the New Testament. And literally, the word presbyteros literally means elder. So we are a church that is ruled by elders. And if you look at Hebrews 13, verse 17, which we just read, notice it says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Notice that the word leaders is in the plural. So the church here at Calvary is ruled by a plurality of elders. And uh, we have two classes of elders. One class is teaching elders. The other class is ruling elders. Uh, I'm a teaching elder, and then if you look in the back of your bulletin, we have listed our ruling elders under the session. We have uh, Steve Bristow, Robert Miller, Ron Rice, and Paul. And uh, basically the distinction between a teaching elder and a ruling elder is that the teaching elder just teaches more. Uh, that's his primary function. And uh, the ruling elders rule more. Um, but we make decisions on behalf of the church when we sit together in session. Uh, so we have these session meetings once a month. We will meet more often if we have to. Uh, but we can only make those decisions when we sit together as a plurality of elders. So I can't go off on my own making a decision for the policy and direction of the church by myself. Uh, I have to be a part of the session when we make those decisions uh, together. Now, Presbyterianism in a, is also a representative form of government. Uh, a man becomes an elder by being nominated and elected by the congregation. And the way that process comes to, uh, to bear is that first there's a nominating uh, season. We just came through that in August and September. We asked members of our church to nominate men to the offices of elder and deacon. And then there's a period of training. After that period of training, the session examines those who've been trained. And then those who are found qualified are put forth to the congregation for election. And you either vote in favor or against for them to go forward and, and become officers. And uh, Sean Michael Lucas stated in his book on being Presbyterian all church power is granted to officers through the call of Jesus Christ, which comes by the consent of the church. And so the church is involved in the process of raising up leaders to the local body. And uh, that's why we've been encouraging you through uh, this sermon series on the vows to participate, to take part. Uh, to, to nominate individuals, but also uh, to grow in your faith that you might uh, enter into the leadership of the church. Now, we belong to the Presbyterian Church in America. This uh, denomination was established in 1973. We're a fairly young denomination. Uh, the reason we were established is because we left the Southern Presbyterian Church that was becoming very liberal and moving away from the study and uh, obedience of the Word of God. And so we established our own uh, denomination. Uh, this church happens to be a charter member in the PCA back in 1973. And uh, our denomination is organized into three courts. Uh, the lowest court is the church session, which I've already talked about. The church session consists of the teaching and ruling elders of a local congregation. 
Uh, these are individuals who have been called by Christ through the election of God's people to exercise oversight over that local congregation. And then the next court is what we call the presbytery, and this consists of all the teaching elders and churches within its bounds that have been accepted by the presbytery. And we are organized into the Tidewater Presbytery, and geographically, the Tidewater Presbytery extends in Virginia from the Atlantic Ocean west to Williamsburg, and we also take in northeast North Carolina and also the eastern shore. And uh, we have about 25 churches. We meet three times a year. We had a meeting just a week and a half ago. And uh, what the Presbytery does is we promote church planting. We examine men who are coming to be licensed and ordained as ministers of the gospel. We oversee all the churches under our care and help with any difficulties in one of the local churches. So perhaps a local church is having um, a disciplinary case that they can't solve on their own. Then you appeal it to the next court up, which is Presbytery, and we'll form a commission, and we'll go in and investigate it, and hopefully we'll be able to resolve uh, the matter. And then the highest court of our denomination is the General Assembly, and uh, it represents in one body all the churches of the denomination. And so teaching elders and ruling elders will go to the General Assembly. It'll meet in some uh, city, and we'll meet for an entire week in, in uh, the month of June. And uh, we'll make those decisions that affect the entire denomination. And so uh, our, our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, has roughly uh, 1,600 churches and approximately 400,000 uh, members. Now, as we think about the, the government of the church, look again back to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. And notice it says there, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now that first word, obey, in the Greek means receiving the teaching, teaching that is given by spiritual leaders. It also has the sense of being persuaded that by teaching of the truth, uh, you accept that truth as your own. Uh, now, you shouldn't just blindly accept whatever is being proclaimed from this pulpit. Hopefully, you have your Bibles open and you're checking everything that I'm saying or whoever's speaking from this pulpit. Um, but, but that's the sense of the word obey, receiving the teaching given by spiritual leaders. And then the second word you see there in verse 17 is the word submit. It means yielding to the proper authority that has been established by God. So the idea of submission is clearly present in these instructions. And so here, here is the difficulty for some of you because perhaps you've had a bad experience in the church. And I, I've talked to many people within this church and outside the church who have had bad experiences uh, in the churches that they've uh, been in. And so how, how do we handle that sort of thing? Uh, this would seem maybe a, a proper excuse not to obey the governing authorities of the church uh, if something is, is wrong or amiss. I uh, read in the, the book of church order that I showed you earlier in the preface, uh, I read this sentence and it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It said, all church courts may err through human frailty, yet it rests upon them to uphold the laws of Scripture, though this obligation be lodged with fallible men. So do you see what that is saying? There's a double emphasis upon the frailty and the fallibility of, of leaders, and yet we are still given the responsibility to exercise Christ's authority in the church. 
And I think the principle that we see throughout Scripture is that God works through fallible instruments to advance his kingdom, to grow his church. I uh, graduated from seminary in uh, 1988. This would be May 1988, and so in October of 88, uh, I had my first call as an assistant pastor. It was at Timonium Presbyterian Church, and this is north of Baltimore. It's a pres- uh, from our denomination that we're in now. And uh, this was a rather large church. Uh, they had um, about 750 to 800 members, and uh, I was now on a pastoral staff of five pastors. And uh, so this is, this is my first call, and my first year... I was really studying to be ordained as as a pastor in the PCA. And so that first year I was able to get ordained, examined by Presbytery, and they approved me, and we had a worship service. I was installed and ordained. And then that next year I'm focusing more on my duties and responsibilities as a pastor. You know, how do I do this pastoral thing? And as I'm engaging in the ministry of the church, I'm realizing there's a riff that's growing in this church. And it began at the top among the leadership, and it filtered down into the church. And I want to tell you, there was a lot of animosity, and there was hostility, and there was even malice, and things were getting ugly. I I remember a congregational meeting where there was quite a tension in the air. And then, for me, the culmination of it was we had a session meeting. And so because it was a large church, we had 18 ruling elders, and all the pastors were there. And it came to a head, and the senior pastor said, I I can't lead here anymore, I'm resigning. And he walked out the door. And then another pastor, he resigned, and he walked out the door. And then a ruling elder resigned, and he hit the road. And then another ruling elder resigned. And then seven more ruling elders resigned, and they just walked out the door, and they weren't coming back. And I didn't know any of this was going to happen, and I'm just stunned. And the next thing I know, one of the remaining elders spoke up, and he said, "Uh, Mark, why don't you moderate the meeting? (laughs) I had never moderated a meeting in my life. I didn't know what it was to moderate a meeting. And so there I am, moderating a meeting for a church that just split in half. And they didn't cover that in in seminary. There there were no books, what happens if half your leadership resigns and you have to lead and, and become the moderator. There's nothing that, we didn't have any classes that covered that. And uh, I, I've seen the underbelly of the church. and And it's not pretty, and I know that. So, so why am I still serving in the church today? Well, it's, it's really because of this principle that we must keep in mind. That, that we must not focus so much on the horizontal, but on what is above the horizontal. Sean Lucas wrote, The source of the church's power lies neither in itself as an institution nor in the combinations of individuals within who themselves possess spiritual power. Rather, the church's authority comes directly to it from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Westminster Confession puts it this way. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a hint of this authority in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Notice what it says. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So as we are ruling as elders over the church, we better be looking above us and realize that we're held accountable by someone who's greater than we are. And he is the head of the church. He is Christ. He is the the one ruling over the church, shepherding the church. 
If you'll notice in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, it speaks of leaders who are faithfully proclaiming the word of God. And we're to follow their examples. And then if you look at verse 9, it speaks of those who are teaching falsehood. Those who are unworthy to be leaders in the church. And then between those two verses, verses 7 and 9, you have this verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and I read that verse, and it seems that this verse comes out of nowhere. It, it, It almost seems as though there's no real connection. But there is a connection. There there is a purpose, and and what the author is telling us is that human leadership may fail, but Jesus will never fail. That Jesus is the truth yesterday, he's the truth today, and he will be the truth forever. That, That Jesus is just and righteous, he was just and righteous yesterday, he's just and righteous today, and he will be just and righteous forever. That Jesus was sovereign yesterday, he's sovereign in his rule today, and he will be sovereign forever. And so the world is an ocean of waves being driven and tossed by the wind, and and we live in tumultuous times with little to no stability or constancy, and we need one unaffected by the forces that wreak havoc and bring upheaval. And Jesus is that one. He is is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The captain of a ship looked into the dark night, and he saw faint lights in the distance. Immediately, he told his signalman to send a message, alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly, a return message was received, alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was angered that his command had been ignored, so he sent a second message, alter your course 10 degrees south, I am the captain. Soon another message was received, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am a seaman third class Jones. Immediately, the captain sent a third message, knowing the fear it would evoke. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. Then the reply came, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. You know, we think we have the upper hand, and we can give our commands and our orders, and then we meet the one who is the rock. The one who is strong. The one who is unmovable. And we must yield to Christ. And follow his truth. And his commands. Because in him. Our well-being rests. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord. Head of the church. Redeemer and Christ. Help us to possess hearts of submission first and foremost towards you and also towards those whom you have placed in authority. Grant to this church your grace that we might prosper in peace, unity, faith, and in the defense and proclamation of the gospel. We give thanks, Lord, that you are our rock, our solid foundation when the world around us is sinking sand. We give thanks that you are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. May your name be forever blessed, for it's in Christ we pray it. Amen.